Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mission Cures webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Megan Golden. I'm the CEO of Mission Cure, and I am here with my colleagues, Linda Martin, Lola Rahib, and Sky Schrader. I co-founded the nonprofit Mission Cure with my younger brother, Eric, in 2017, after he was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis. And Eric is here with us today, and you will hear from him shortly. And then we were soon joined by our co-founder, Linda Martin, who is also here with us today, whose daughter, Amy, was suffering also from chronic pancreatitis. Linda is now the chair of Mission Cure's board. Mission Cure aims to improve the lives of people dealing with chronic and recurrent acute pancreatitis by developing effective therapies and improving care. This webinar is part of our patient education program, which is supported by ABVI, and we're very grateful for their support. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. First, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be posted on Mission Cure's website tomorrow. Uh, live captioning is available if that's helpful to you. Uh, it uses AI, so there could be some mistakes. Simply click live transcript at the bottom of your screen. And uh, you are all in lin listen only mode, meaning we can't hear you, but please type your questions in the Q&A box on your webinar control panel, which should be there at the bottom, and we will answer them. Um, after the presentations, or if we can, as we're going along. So uh, next slide, please. We are here because you, our community, have told us that pain is your top priority. And I know from my family's experience that pancreatitis pain is excruciating and that it could really make it impossible to live a normal life. Since the beginning of Mission Cure, we've been searching for effective treatments for pancreatitis pain while also working toward treatments and cures for the disease itself. So when we found this team at Johns Hopkins, I was struck by a few things. One, they look at what's causing the pain, whether it's ongoing inflammation of your pancreas or nerve damage or something else, and they develop treatment approaches that address those specific issues. Second, they're international leaders in the brain science and pain science. And third, they bring different types of expertise together to provide kind of best practice treatment, which is pretty hard to find. So that's why Mission Cure helped develop the concept for the Johns Hopkins pancreatitis pain research program and provided some funding to launch it in 2022. So now I'm happy to introduce our first presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Glenn Treisman. Dr. Treisman is professor of psychiatry and medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's director of the pain treatment program and co-director of the Amos Center, which is a very cool program that studies GI gastrointestinal disorders and the relationship between food, the nervous system of the GI tract specifically, the microbiome and disease. And he's really a giant in the field of pain treatment. So Dr. Treisman, thank you for joining us and kicking us off today. And I'm just going to ask a few questions to get us started. Thanks. I just wanna say before I start, how much we appreciate Mission Cure's support of this program. It's been very good for us, and we appreciate you coming to us and helping us get this wrong. That's, that's great. We're, we're very happy to do that. Um, so tell us, how did you come to this work, to, to focusing on treating people with pancreatitis pain? Well, my career has been around the, um, the reciprocal relationship between psychiatric and mental disorders and physical disorders. I started out as an AIDS doctor looking at the inflammatory damage from HIV in people with chronic infection with HIV and mood disorders and other things. And pretty soon was seeing a lot of patients with neuropathic pain syndromes as the HIV causes a lot of neuro neuropathic pain. And from there began to work with the pain group at Johns Hopkins. We have an inpatient pain service when I started doing that, we got referrals from a number of my colleagues in gastroenterology for abdominal pain. And one of the things we found out is that 
Visceral pain is probably one of the worst kinds of pain there is. And abdominal visceral pain, like pancreatitis pain, is very severe and debilitating. However, most of the time when patients came to see us, the problem wasn't ongoing damage. It was damage to the visceral nerves. And as we started to do that kind of work in a variety of GI conditions and look at dys dysmotility and gastroparesis and other things that cause abdominal pain, we began to see more and more of these patients with chronic pancreatitis pain. And that's how I got to it. Um, and uh, Dr. Speed, who you'll meet in a few minutes, uh, came to join me a number of years ago because she's had an interest in pain as well. Well, and you uh, kind of jumped right into my next question, which is, can you tell us a little bit more about what causes pancreatitis pain? Sure. So your body has nerves in it, and your brain doesn't know the difference between something that's damaging your body and nerve signals that say things are being damaged even when they're not. An example is, um, is people have phantom limb pain. The limb is gone, but it still hurts. And the person will say, the center of my palm is hurting when they don't have a palm on that arm anymore. So you can't tell the difference between what's pain and what's just nerve signaling. And damaged nerves signal noisy signals. So we think most of the patients with chronic pancreatitis pain, the pain is being caused by spilling uh, abdominal con uh, pancreatic contents to the abdomen that damages those nerves. And those damaged nerves then send false signals. There's a number of different ways that can happen. The nerves themselves can produce noise. The central nervous system can be sensitized and begin to misinterpret signals. And the sympathetic nervous system can get overactivated. And those are all different and they all require different kinds of treatment, but none of them are being caused by tissue damage. The first thing we look at in pancreatitis patients is, is this damage to their abdomen going on because they're continuing to have pancreatitis or is this nerve pain? And the patient can't tell the difference. They feel for the most part, exactly the same. So um, that's definitely helpful. So just to conclude, the Johns Hopkins Pancreatitis Pain Research Program takes a different approach. Why is this program important? Well, there's a number of reasons. Number one, the most important one for me, <clears throat> for Tracy, is that we don't like to see people's lives ruined. And this is a condition that is incredibly debilitating and ruins people's lives. If there was no treatment, it wouldn't be that much fun, but we would still try to make it good for people. But there is treatment. We are very effective in many patients at decreasing chronic pain. The most important thing is to help people who have chronic pancreatitis pain. Secondly, um, we don't really know what things will work and who yet. So we have lots of medications that change the way nerves function that are helpful, but they're not all helpful in the same patients. Like I said, sometimes the problem is uh, sympathetic activation. Sometimes the problems, sorry, I'll, I'll move closer. I just, it's because of the light. Someone said they can't hear me. Um, sometimes the problem is, is um, ongoing uh, pain signaling from the nerves themselves. Other times it's sympathetic activation. Those use different medications. So we're trying to figure that out is very important. Third thing is not everybody gets pancreatitis pain. What makes some people vulnerable to it and others not? And probably the last and most important thing is, can we prevent this pain and can we teach people how to treat it more effectively? So in the world, there's lots of people treating patients with chronic pancreatitis, but they don't all know the things we know from treating other kinds of chronic pain. And we wanna publish and educate people. So the research about why the pain occurs and the research about what treatments work is very important to helping the large global community of people with pancreatitis pain, which although it is um, it's not terribly rare, most doctors don't see a lot of it. And um, so there's very little knowledge in how to treat it. And there's no good textbook chapter that says, do this, then do this, then do this. Eventually, Dr. Speed will write those textbook chapters. Well, thank you, Dr. Treisman. And that's also why we're, we at Mission Cure are supporting this. And we hope that there will be those manuals and textbook chapters and proven treatments and that every single patient worldwide eventually will be able to have access to that. So now I will introduce Dr. Tracy Speed, who is the director of the Pancreatitis Pain Research Program. 
Dr. Speed has a medical degree as well as a PhD. She's an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University Medical School. She's director of the Johns Hopkins Personalized Pain Program, and she's an expert in chronic pain management and psychiatric disorders. Dr. Speed. Thank you, Megan. And I wanna echo what Dr. Treisman said is we really appreciate Mission Cure support um, in our ability to start this clinic. Um, so I wanna start by um, introducing you to the members of our clinical team at the Johns Hopkins Chronic Pancreatitis Pain Clinic. So thanks to the generous support of Mission Cure, we're able to create a multidisciplinary team that might be um, slightly different than a, a typical clinic situation that you would come to. Um, so when you come to our clinic, you would actually be seen by multiple providers at the same time. And that's so you have the opportunity to tell your story once and also to hear us talk about um, your history and your presentation and hear our clinical decision making and be able to engage with us in that process. So myself and Dr. Treisman are the directors of the clinic. And then we have two fabulous nurse practitioners, Talia Griffin and Anna Ko, who tend to lead a lot of the interviews and tend to be the, the point people who are um, interacting with patients or with you um, in between visits. We have an excellent psychologist, Dr. Atwood, who's an expert in sleep medicine, as well as health anxiety, who's the, um, who is present during the interview and also is available for those people who, if you live in Maryland, she's able to see you separately for different sleep interventions. One of the most important people in our clinic is Tom Moses, who's our coordinator. And he's the person you would liaise with in order to schedule a clinic visit. And um, he is so helpful in helping to coordinate getting um, labs and other information to you and, and um, helping us reach your providers. And then we have a clinical research infrastructure built into the clinic. So Robert Burns is one of our research coordinators who may reach out to you asking you to complete some surveys and help gather some information about your history. The other members of our interdisciplinary team tend to rotate through the clinic. Um, we have a number of gastroenterology fellows who are studying to become pancreatologists who rotate through our clinic as well as medical students and other residents who are interested in learning more about the specialty of pain medicine and treating chronic pain. Next slide, please. Thanks. So when you come to the Johns Hopkins Clinic, um, we're gonna have a first visit, it's gonna be a very comprehensive exam. So you wanna expect to spend about one to two hours with us. And again, you're gonna meet with a team of providers. And we're gonna be able to get your medical records from your other providers before the clinic and review those notes and your laboratories and your previous imaging studies. Um, and then we're also gonna get an extensive comprehensive history. So we're gonna ask questions that is more than just your history of pancreatitis. We also wanna understand different reasons that you might be vulnerable to chronic pain development. Um, and so therefore we're gonna ask information about your family history, we're gonna gather information about um, who you are and what experiences you've had from birth through childhood to present day, um, additional medical history. Um, we're also gonna ask about your psychiatric and mental health history to understand some of the vulnerabilities um, that you may have that increase your risk of chronic pain. And then there's a lot of other factors that can influence one's susceptibility to pain, including our sleep, our diet, and our lifestyle and exercise. So in addition to just wanting to know who you are and get to know you as a whole person, uh, we're gonna also understand how your pancreatitis and your pain have affected your quality of life. Next slide, please. So in terms of expectations from coming to a consultation with us, um, you'll initially meet with one of our nurse practitioners um, who's gonna start the interview process with you. And then myself or Dr. Treisman is gonna join. Um, and you'll also have a number of other providers with you. And by the end of the intake, we're going to be able to explain our, um, our diagnosis of what we think is causing that pain. So as Megan and, and Dr. Treisman alluded to before, we're going to talk to you about if we think that this is from nerve damage, if we think that there might be an autoimmune component that's exacerbating the pain um, or some other type of inflammatory process, or maybe other some type of co-occurring condition that can activate pain. So we'll, again, give you a diagnosis and explain our formulation. 
And then we're gonna be able to offer some treatment recommendations. So a lot of you who have had chronic pain may al already be on some medications to target that pain. And for some of those medications, your provider might've started you on a lower dose and not raise that dose. So when possible, we might increase that dose to see if we can maximize that medication's benefits. We might also suggest some new medications. And some of them are medications that are used to treat other chronic pain conditions, things like migraines um, or, um, or other types of pain. And then we also know that there's a number of psychological and behavioral interventions that can help adapt kind of the maladaptive behaviors that we tend to take on when we're trying to manage pain. So cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness are two of the most well-known evidence-based medicines for chronic pain. And so we might ask you to meet with Dr. Atwood or psychologist, or if you're living out of state, we might, we'll find someone for you who we would recommend to be able to engage in that therapy if appropriate. A lot of times when you're coming to see us, there's probably more workup that needs to be done to explain um, and help us understand why you're having pain. So most likely we're gonna order other labs and other imaging tests. And then if there's other specialists at Hopkins or at your local institution or academic center that we think might be able to help um, also manage your pain or undergo some type of intervention, we're gonna refer you to them as well. So at the end of this two hour evaluation, hopefully you'll have a comprehensive plan and we're gonna then schedule a follow-up visit. And um, we typically see people about three months after we initially see you. Next slide, please. Thanks. <laughs> so as a reminder, we're a consultation clinic. So we um, would hope that you have a primary care provider, a gastroenterologist, um, a psychiatrist, a therapist, or someone who's managing your pancreatitis and your other medical conditions. Um, we are happy to discuss your case with your provider. And in fact, we encourage that and we hope that that happens. Um, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll schedule a follow-up visit for you and um, we might see you every three months. If we make some really um, helpful recommendations and you're doing really well, we don't need to see you that frequently. Um, so we might space out those visits. And even though we're not gonna be your primary providers, we are available to answer questions. So we have a, a large team to be able to help navigate um, certain questions and kind of review the labs that we order and imaging and talk about next steps and sometimes tweak the medication recommendations that we've made. So we can use through our Hopkins system, we can use the MyChart to communicate with us, um, and you can also contact Tom Moses directly, our coordinator. As I mentioned before, we also have our research um, infrastructure that's embedded in our clinic. So as part of that, we are sending out surveys to everyone who's um, been to our clinic. And if you're willing to do so, we're gonna ask that you complete these surveys, ask questions about your pain, your quality of life, your sleep, and that's information that's gonna help us understand the trajectory of hopefully your recovery and hopefully your improvement. Um, and that's gonna help us treat you. And it's also gonna help kind of the greater good of finding out what, what are the best approaches um, and the best kind of comprehensive multimodal treatments for pain management and pancreatitis. Next slide. So as we've talked about, we really do have a lot of research goals um, and there's a lot of benefits that we hope um, that everyone will see from this clinic. So one is that we do wanna kind of develop and um, further evolve a pancreatitis registry so we can understand more about what's happening with individuals who are having chronic pain. And so that will again, help us understand the trajectory um, of the clinical course of individuals with pain related to pancreatitis. This is gonna give us a better understanding of certain factors, um, co-occurring conditions, risk factors that can increase the risk of chronic pain or debility or poor quality of life. And then overall, we're hoping that we can understand what are the best treatment approaches and how do we provide kind of best quality care and evidence-based care for patients with chronic pancreatitis pain. And as Dr. Treisman mentioned before, we also wanna be able to disseminate our knowledge and help other providers be able to manage pain. We know that pain medicine is a specialty field and a lot of people don't get training in medical school and even residency on how to manage pain. Um, and so we wanna be able to help our colleagues um, across the US and, and internationally be able to, to help learn how to manage chronic pancreatitis pain as well. 
thank you, Dr. Speed, and uh, internationally is relevant because I hear I see some people in the chat piping up from the UK and Europe, um, and we hear you. Uh, so now I would like to introduce my own brother, Eric Golden, to talk about his experience. Uh, Eric. Thanks, Megan. Uh, and thanks to Dr. Speed and, and Treesman uh, for participation in this in this wonderful program. Very happy to talk about my experience with it. Uh, I was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis about a dozen years ago, and um, severe pain really has been my number one problem. Uh, it's acute during flare-ups, but for many years it it was daily pain. Uh, it's worse at night. Uh, it interferes with my sleep, and as folks know, if if you don't sleep, that has a range of health implications, including making a chronic disease like pancreatitis worse. Uh, I will say, um, not to be a modest, but I'm, I think I'm a, an active and proactive patient. Uh, I've spent the last dozen years trying to learn as much as I can about the disease. Uh, Megan and I, and with Linda, co-founded Mission Cure. Uh, to try to find interventions. I have a, a terrific pancreatologist at a top hospital. And I've really tried a lot over the years to try to address the pain I was experiencing. And, and some of the things include very careful attention to my diet. I've been on a range of medications, including for a number of years, opioids, uh, and as well as mindfulness and meditation. Uh, we actually did a webinar on mindfulness and meditation for chronic pain which I would highly recommend uh, that people check out because it really has been the most effective thing for me in terms of the psychological aspect, not just of pain, but the disease in general. Um, and I've been to pain centers at, at other top hospitals as well. So uh, frankly, when I uh, was lucky enough to be one of the pilot patients at the Johns Hopkins Pancreatitis Pain Program, I didn't go in with real high expectations because I figured that I was one of the patients that had tried most things and, and maybe there wasn't much new to do there. Um, but that changed pretty early on uh, because uh, as Dr. Speed explained, uh, the team there uh, took a very detailed history starting from when I was very young uh, and uh, ending up with all the interventions that I've tried over the years. And I listed all of them and we discussed them. And then they said, well, did you try this medication? Did you try that medication? Did you try this medication? Did you try that medication? And they probably came up with a list of 10 things that I hadn't tried. And so um, I really realized at that point that there probably was a lot that uh, a lot of options that remained, which was frankly very heartening. Uh, the other thing they told me was, uh, listen, what, what you've heard Dr. Treesman and Dr. Speed say, to, say today, which is, we know a lot about this area. Uh, we've studied it extensively. There are a lot of tools in our toolbox, and we think we're going to make you feel better. And frankly, I hadn't really heard that from pain doctors in the past. Um, and so that that made me hopeful, which, which is also a good thing. Um, they did tell me after the whole examination that they thought that a good amount of my pain was due to nerve damage, uh, just as Dr. Treesman explained. And I have to say that uh, is also um, was very heartening to hear because if you're lying in bed awake in a tremendous amount of pain, you can't help but think, wow, something is really going wrong here, or even this is killing me, or this is going to kill me. And when I uh, was told that a lot of it wasn't new disease, inflammation, damage, but remnant for old damage, it just made me feel better. Um, but the pain's still there. So the question was, what can we do about it? Uh, and one thing that, uh, that the team recommended was that one of the medications I was on, gabapentin, I was on what they thought was a below a therapeutic dose. So right medicine, just too little of it and it wasn't able to have an impact at that level. So they raised the amount in several stages. And then they, uh, as you know, Dr. Treesman said, there's a bunch of interventions. It may depend on the cause, it may depend on the people. So they said, we'll start with uh, another drug for neuropathic pain. 
Uh, and they said, you know, give it a month or two to see if it works. And uh, I had a great experience. I thanked him. I left. I started the medication the next day. And uh, fast forward about a month, and it made a huge difference in my daily pain. Uh, I was surprised, but it probably reduced it by, I would say, over 50%, maybe even 70%. So where I was in a really a good amount of pain every day, or at least every night, um, that has really been, you know, that's really been improved a lot. And I'm not in horrible pain every night. And uh, the medication they gave me uh, helped me sleep as well. So I started getting a better night's sleep. I wasn't kept up because of the pain. And uh, there was just a lot of great benefits that flow from that. Uh, I was able to start exercising more. Uh, and more intensely. Um, I gained weight, which as a lot of folks listening know, that's, uh, that's a good thing with our disease. I had lost about 25 pounds uh, due to the disease, and I, and I put probably a 10 or 12 back on of good weight. Um, and it just, it had a, a psychological effect knowing uh, that, uh, first of all, I was feeling better, but also knowing that this is, you know, pre-existing pain that can be addressed really had a, a really good effect. Um, so I will say that the experience was just a, a, a tremendously positive one for me. And uh, I wanna thank Dr. Treesman, Dr. Speed and Tom Moses and the entire team there for the good care that they took of me and, and uh, the impact they've had on my life. And uh, so I would, if, if there are patients listening out there that are in intractable pain, even if you've tried a lot over the years, I would um, I would urge you to think about this. It was uh, it was well worth the trip out to Baltimore for me, and uh, really glad and grateful that Mission Cure and Johns Hopkins put this together. And I think it really could stand to benefit a lot of people. So thank you, and uh, you know, standing by if, if folks have questions for me. Thanks, bro. Um, and. So now back to Dr. Speed to tell people what to do if they want to come to the program. Great. So if you are interested in coming to our program, um, Tom Moses is going to be the point person. He's our clinic coordinator and he's um, going to introduce you to the program. Um, so his contact information is here and I think it will also be on the Mission Cure website. Um, Tom will pass on your medical history to us um, and we will review and see if we think that you are eligible for the clinic. When we say who's eligible for the clinic, um, we are focused on individuals who have had chronic pancreatitis um, and or acute recurring pancreatitis. Um, so this is something we'd expect you to have um, experienced for a few months at least. And we would expect that you'd have some imaging and blood tests to help make that diagnosis. Um, and then the obvious is that there would be some type of functional or visceral abdominal pain that's impacting your daily life that you feel like your, your local providers have been struggling to manage. Um, once Tom gets your information and if you're eligible for the clinic, um, we will ask for your medical records. Um, in today's day and age of sharing medical records, sometimes we do have access to them, even if you've never been in the Johns Hopkins system. And if not, we will get them from your medical provider so that we can review them and review your history before we come. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar, Johns Hopkins is located in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and we recently had a patient coming from out of town who was excited to also come and eat some of our crabs um, before the appointment. <laughs> Um, but we are able to see patients. If you're able to come visit us in Maryland, um, we are happy to accept people nationally or internationally. Um, Mr. Moses will review your insurance and let you know if there would be what type of copay there would be or if there'd be any out of pocket fees. Um, expect to spend about one to two hours with us for that initial visit. And then if you continue to follow up with us um, at three month or more intervals, those appointments will be a little bit shorter in three months. Um, if you do live in Maryland, we are still able to do telehealth based on current um, requirements. So that might be an option if you're in the state of Maryland. Um, and then if there's any other future imaging or tests that we're recommending, a lot of those can be done locally through your local phlebotomy lab or radiology lab. 
Um, and if there were any special tests that needed to be done that we only do at Hopkins, we would let you know and try to help you plan that accordingly. So you would have to minimize your number of trips um, to our hospital. And happy to take questions at the end of this. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Speed. And now it is time for questions. Uh, and the questions will be moderated by Dr. Lola Rahib, who is the Vice President for Translational Research here at Mission Cure. Lola? Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you. Um, so we will try to get through um, all the questions. I think a lot of them have already been answered, but if there are additional questions, we will post the answers on our website. Um, so one of the, uh, a, a lot of people are asking if the chronic pain from chronic pancreatitis is completely from the nerve damage or is it has no correlation to the pancreas itself. So I think pain is multifactorial and it can sometimes be for multiple reasons. And it's important to realize that we have kind of different nerve pathways. So there's our peripheral nerves. Um, there's the nerves that go up to our brain, like the central sensitization that Dr. Treason mentioned. And then there's our autonomic nervous system, um, which is kind of like our fight or flight response. And then our GI tract has its own nervous system. And so any of those nerves could be damaged um, through an active local damage or through signaling through our autoimmune system or our autonomic nervous system um, as well. And so for some people, it might be that the nerves themselves are getting, have some type of damage, or again, they're misfiring and saying that they're damaged. Um, and there could be kind of both acute and or chronic reasons that those nerves are saying that you're damaged. And each person is different. Oftentimes it is a neuropathic pain that we see, but again, that is part of the comprehensive workup that we'll be able to do is to say, we think that your immune system is a little bit overactive and that might be exacerbating your pain. Uh, we think that poor sleep is activating your pain system, um, or we think that this might be related to some inflammation in the pancreas. Um, we have a question for Eric about his diagnosis. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about your diagnostic odyssey, um, as some people are, are interested when you were diagnosed and how it came about. Sure. So I was, I would say I was misdiagnosed from anywhere from five years to maybe 20 years. Um, and uh, back in, I guess it was around 2010, I started getting sicker and sicker, had some really acute attacks. Um, I wasn't a person who really ever had any sick days. So this was unusual for me. And uh, eventually, I actually was uh, going to get a, uh, a, a surgery to cut out part of my intestine um, because they thought it was diverticulitis. And at the last second, the surgeon said, I'm just not positive that's what it is. He went and looked around and found a bunch of adhesions that was caused by inflammation. And, uh, and then I, one of my doctors sent me to get an endoscopic ultrasound, and that showed extensive scarring in my pancreas, and, and as well as my uh, enzyme levels had been slightly elevated, which is not uncommon for chronic pancreatitis, but a gastroenterologist who was a wonderful person, but she just didn't know that you can have mildly elevated uh, lipase and have that be chronic pancreatitis. She thought it had to be, you know, in the thousands in order to to signal pancreatitis. So it was it was just missed. Uh, but eventually, I ended up um, with the with the right folks, and um, you know, it's been a, it's been an odyssey ever since. So hopefully that uh, that answers the question. <laughs> By the way, in the chat, which I cannot respond to for some reason. There was a question, what was the new medication that you were put on? Um, I, and I don't mind saying it was a, it was a medication called Remeron. I do want to stress that, uh, you know, th these things are very personal to each patient. So I, I don't think it's like you can take what worked for me and, and just copy it, but, uh, but happy to let folks know about that. Thank you. Um, so our next question, um, we've actually been getting quite a few questions like this, um, whether um, there are possible treatments for patients who have, who come from a different um, 
the type of pancreatitis, whether it's autoimmune, idiopathic, or even if they've already had surgery and don't have a pancreas, but still have pain. Yeah, I, I think um, Dr. Treisman and I have managed lots of different types of um, chronic pain conditions and GI pain conditions. And so regardless of what stage of pancreatitis you have or the level of um, exocrine um, this deficiency, uh, we do have treatment options to help manage pain. And again, it kind of, un it takes understanding your history and your background and what you've tried before and the kind of different stages that you're at with your pancreatitis and with your other comorbidities um, to be able to find the appropriate treatments. But we do have lots of different treatments and we don't always have the answer the first time. Sometimes we have to try. I know patients don't like to hear about trial and error, um, but I think as what Eric said is that we do have a list of different medications that we know that can help modulate your pain pathways and help treat pain. And so we will continue to work with you to find the right medication until we've been able to reduce your pain. And we never promise that we can make the pain go away completely, um, but we can certainly help to improve your quality of life and your functioning. I would um, like to jump, uh, sorry, Lola, can I jump in for one second to address something that's come up in the chat? Yeah, sure. Okay. Great. Uh, so I did notice uh, chat about how it sounds like we're encouraging people to come to this clinic. And, and yes, <laughs> we are because we have put a lot of effort into figuring out what best practice pain treatment looks like and know from personal experience, it's very hard to get um, normally. And so I even put some funding into establishing this. And it's got, as Dr. Speed said, a research mission of really learning from the people that come what is most effective and what's an ideal model of care that we can then share with others. So in order for us to learn, we do need people to come and use the program. And based on my brother's experience and others that we have spoken to, uh, we really feel good about encouraging this because I think it really helps people. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, what if a someone um, has pain, but they don't have the definitive diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis? Can they still come to the clinic? I think we'd want to review the medical records and understand um, what someone's history of pancreatitis is or could be. Um, we certainly want to be available to help people manage pain, um, but there might be a different provider out there who's more appropriate. And as part of this mission, we are really trying to understand um, the causes and treatments for chronic pancreatitis. So we, we are doing our best to kind of stay on mission and to be able to really build our, our clinical research program as well. We do have a, uh, a, a multidisciplinary pain clinic um, that's separate from this. And... Um, <clears throat> Mr. Moses can help uh, people who are not pancreatitis patients uh, come to that clinic, but we need a referral from a doctor to know the case. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, what about insurance? Will my insurance cover this consultation? That is a good question. <laughs> and that is something that uh, Mr. Moses can help us understand. He can review your insurance and let you know. I will say a lot of insurance programs will cover it, but not they all won't. And um, so we could only know by knowing your specific insurance and letting you know as an, on an individual basis. And we have a follow-up question of, do you accept Medicare? We do in general, yes. Yeah. And again, I, I would just say that we'd want to do on an indi individual basis, just review your insurance and let you know what we expect the cost to be. Great. Thank you. Maybe um, our final question is, why is, why is the clinic in the psychiatry department? Yeah, we sometimes have people come in and say, oh, maybe you think I'm crazy because I'm here seeing a psychiatrist. <laughs> and we don't think you're crazy. Probably your doctor doesn't think you're crazy. 
But what's going on is that, so we are medical physicians who are trained in medicine who happen to specialize in the brain and in mental health and then who subspecialize in pain management. And you know, pain is again, multifactorial. So there are, there are nerves in your body that could be causing pain. And then there are nerves in your brain itself that can be causing the pain. And it's all connected and your body and your mind are connected. So we just happen to be the experts that can understand kind of the whole person perspective and how the brain and the body are communicating. Um, and we have become experts in this, just like sometimes anesthesiologists are experts in chronic pain. Um, but it, it kind of comes from our perspective of the whole person and being able to understand a lot of the different risk factors that can also play a role in chronic pain, which sometimes does include um, psychiatric conditions like anxiety, depression, or sleep difficulties. I'm gonna amplify one thing that Tracy said. Um, some of you have had the experience of your doctors thinking that this is psychiatric and that your pain isn't real. And one of the great things about being a psychiatrist is as part of my training is that I know, uh, I know that it's not psychiatric and um, it's, it's not a simple issue of doctors saying, well, I don't know what's causing this, so it must be psychiatric. You have to actually see the patients and say, yes, there are psychosomatic kinds of pain but this is or is not one of them. You're not doing people a service by saying um, this is psychiatric if it's not, and you're not doing a service by saying it's psychiatric if it is. So you have to think about each individual patient and what the factors are that go into their pain. The main thing, reason it's in psychiatry is that patients are often very much abandoned. Um, and psychiatry is the place where patients go if they're not getting any care. We take care of the people who are abandoned a lot. That's a really important part of our mission, give you back your life. Great, thank you. So we have, um, we had, we, we have another question of, do I need to do, should we speak to our doctor before contacting anyone about this specific appointment? And also what about international patients? Do you see international patients and how would they pay? Would they pay privately? So we, we really do encourage anyone who's interested in this program to talk to your physician about it. Um, and ideally they would be making a referral, um, but we wanna work as a team, right? Everyone needs a quarterback, someone who's um, helping really manage and their case and their, their health conditions. And we are consultants. This is a, a consultation clinic. Um, so we often, as Dr. Treisman said, we often are working with people who have felt abandoned by the health system and kind of you end up playing the role of a quarterback, but ideally you have someone locally who becomes your quarterback and is making the referral. And we are happy to, to provide our recommendations to those physicians and we're happy to communicate with them. Um, and we have uh, many times had thoughtful discussions with outside providers. So we definitely encourage you to talk to your physicians um, and hopefully they would be making the referral to come see us um, and that they're, you know, we can all work together as a team. Um, we do see international patients, um, and um, at, sometimes people do pay out of pocket, um, and then sometimes it might be covered. Again, that's kind of working through the, our international office, and they can help kind of clarify the cost. Thank you, Dr. Speed. Um, so we do have another question on whether amitriptyline is um, one of the treatment options, and maybe if you can speak to to that and other antidepressants um, used to treat pain. So we do use a lot of our um, antidepressants as neuromodulators to help manage pain. Um, and that's because pain is complicated, but we understand that a lot of the neurochemicals that regulate our mood and our sleep and our energy and our motivation those are the same chemicals that regulate our pain processes. So something like amitriptyline or nortriptyline are used, and those are medications that we use. Um, we use the whole, a whole variety of different antidepressants, anti-seizure medications, and other combinations of medications to help manage pain. Great, thank you. So we do have a logistical question. How quickly are you typically able to see patients after they are deemed eligible? 
So this clinic is growing. So um, we've had, um, it's probably a, a relatively short wait list <laughs> uh, for a type of chronic pain clinic. So I think we're right now looking at a couple months out for a consultation appointment. Um, and then one day this, this clinic, as we get more recognition and become busier, that wait list might get longer, but right now it's, it's about a couple months out. And then, um, so we do have one more question about if somebody did want to pay out of pocket, would that be very expensive? Or is that something that they would have to, um, discuss? Um, on an individual basis? Um, I, I will say it's probably relatively expensive, um, not cheap. <laughs> um, but again, I think we'd want to clarify that as an individual basis and not um, set expectations or try to set limitations right now. So please feel free to reach out to us and we can kind of review that with anyone. Great. So I think we got through all of our questions. Um, so I will um, give it back to Megan. Great. Thank you. Uh, so now actually to wrap things up, we're going to turn it over to Sky Schrader, who is Mission Cure's creative communications manager. And you've probably heard from Sky or seen her handiwork on all of our social media platforms, as well as our email. So uh, we're very thrilled to have her here and I will turn it over to Sky. Thank you. And thank you so much for uh, to everyone for so actively participating in our Q&A. Um, also, thank you to our incredible guest speakers for being here today and for the work that you're doing. Uh, I saw that we got a question about posting this, a recording of this for you to refer back to. We will have that on our website. We will also email you that link tomorrow. Um, if you can please take a moment to complete the short survey that is now provided in the chat box by Lola, that would be amazing. You will also receive a pop-up with this survey link as soon as we close the session, depending on your device. If it does not pop up for you, you will also have a chance to fill it out via link we send in our follow-up email. Um, this survey will help us be more responsive to your needs and will also ask you to nominate future topics. You can also help spread the word about Mission Cures work by following us on social media and by signing up for our email newsletter. There you can keep an eye out for information about our next webinar regarding clinical trials. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you all for coming and have a great day.